So I'd printed the test print, managed to somehow make a 10 minute video out of it. But what was next? What was the next print to come off my printer? What was my next move? I travelled to Thingiverse, a fantastic website set up by MakerBot that is basically a search engine for STL files. Those are the 3D files you're going to be using uh, for the most part to print things. Uh, there's a massive resource on here of incredible free files that you can download and print yourself. I was looking for something that was easy to print but also easy to paint because I didn't just want to have a pile of grey models sat around my room. After an extensive search, I think I'd settled on something. A baby Groot. For those of you who don't know, Baby Groot features in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. This cute little character took the world by storm when he came out and, perhaps unbeknownst to the creators, started a resurgence in baby characters. From TV shows to other movies, even to products and adverts. They may not have known it at the time, but in 20 years from now, we will look back at Baby Groot being the start of something we thought was great, but quickly realised we did not want. But hey, that's not the fault of this little guy. He fit my needs perfectly. He was apparently relatively easy to print. He was relatively easy to paint, mostly just being wood texture all over with not many fine details. And he would look cool on the shelf. I threw him into Cheetu Box, scaled him down, threw some auto supports on, which please never use auto supports, more on that later. And I pressed print. Incredibly, despite me completely riding on the seat of my pants here, the print was a success. Came off the build plate perfectly. The problem was I'd used really heavy, thick supports and probably too many of them. And I was a little rough in removing them and poor Groot lost a couple of fingers. Rather than just throw him out, I thought I would finish the process of curing him as the resin's used now and there's no harm in having a little model that I'm going to be able to practice my paint techniques on. But I also realised that this really was a little model and that's mostly because of how I augmented him in Cheetu Box. So for round two, I was going to make a bigger one. Okay, here goes nothing. Two for two. Ooh. Oh, finished. Time elapsed six hours and two minutes. It, will, it looks good. Is it good? Let's see. Yeah, it looks all right to me. Oh no, the hand's messed up again. What do you think, Groose? Uh, uh. So as you can see, uh, second attempt, I split the model up into two parts and the head came out fine. Uh, it turned out really good. I supported it from the rear, so there was a little bit of uh, sanding and stuff to clean up the little pock marks where the supports meet the model, but overall I was very happy. It was the body that was causing me a problem, and this footage you're looking at here is attempt number three, actually. I ended up cutting all the others because I was just getting depressed. Um, I was ending up with this really flat hand, and it was pretty much uh, obvious that it was due to poor supporting. You'll see there's loads of supports there, but I think I'm trying to thin supports. So here's you supporting a Model 101. I'm no expert, I'll put a link in the description to a really great channel, 3D Printing Pro, that cover this sort of stuff in detail. But let's imagine we're making Maui's hook from Moana. We can start the hook attached to the build plate, and as the build plate lifts up, it's going to print a single layer of the hook as we go. So far, so good. And each of these layers will stick to the layer before it, which in turn is stuck to the build plate. No problems there. Unfortunately, at some point we're going to get to the overhang, we're going to get to the point of the hook. And at that point, there is nowhere for that point to attach to. The build plate's moved up, and, uh, and that little point there has nowhere to sort of stick onto. That's going to be causing an issue. 
If you left it like this and pressed print, that little bit of resin that cured would just start floating around the tank and you would need to clear it all out like this. So that's where supports come in. Cheatybox and other slicing programs have a way of generating supports. You can click on the model where you want one to go, but fine tuning the size of the support, the amount of the supports really is an art form and something I'm just gonna have to get better at through trial and error. So trial number four and error number, well, I've lost counts, but it was a success. After spending a little time on some Facebook groups asking for some advice, a few people pointed out that this group doesn't need supports at all. It's actually designed to print straight from the build plate and the 3D model itself is designed so that there's no overhanging pieces where supports are needed. So I slapped it on the plate and pressed go and we had a perfect print. There are a lot of other variables as to whether or not a print's gonna be successful, such as the temperature, the type of resin you use, layer times and how long each layer is cured for under the UV light light but that's all a little bit advanced for this vlog right now. All you need to know is that we got the print successful, cured it up and then after a little bit of sanding down of his neck the head fit into the body. The next step was to prime him with some spray paint. Luckily it was a beautiful day outside. It was a beautiful day to clear out the cat litter, but you know, sometimes stuff's gotta get done. It was also a beautiful day for a little tipple. This week's beer is Great Lakes Brewery's Octopus Wants a Fight. Great Lakes Brewery is in Toronto, Canada, and it produces this 6.2% American style IPA. Lots of tropical fruit notes head into a woody pine finish, and whilst it's nothing particularly to write home about, it went down pretty smoothly. As always, if you'd like to recommend a beer, let me know in the comments. Salute! Once I was sufficiently lubricated, it was time to spray Groot. I was just using a regular black priming spray from the hardware store, nothing special or specific here, and keeping the can about a foot away. I covered Groot with sweeping light strokes, opting for two lighter coats than one thicker one. Once he dried, it was time to take him down to my painting desk. Oh yeah, I haven't shown you my painting desk. I quickly decided, and when I say I decided, my wife decided that if I was going to start painting figures, I wasn't going to be able to do it at the dining room table or on the kitchen surface. So I spent a little bit of money on a space to paint, and it looks like this. <laughs> I'm only joking, it looks like this. It wasn't much, but it was mine. I'd scoured Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace to find some cheap workbench furniture that wouldn't really matter if I ended up ruining it. The main bench in particular had got a bungee jumping light, some issues with the shelves and a slightly bowed work surface. But with a bit of elbow grease, I managed to get the light back up and running and an adjustment on the shelves allowed the Jontatron 5000 to fit perfectly. The epoxy glue on the lamp needed some time to dry, so the first coat at least was still gonna happen upstairs on the kitchen table. Next week, I'm going to be taking a tour to my local hobby shop and picking up some specific paints and equipment for painting models. But for now, I'm just using stuff that I've picked up at the hobby store or at Walmart. Whilst the old adage 
is that a bad workman blames his tools, I really do think there's something to be said about using the correct equipment. But whilst I'm still a little unsure as to whether I really want to focus on painting models, I didn't want to have a huge outlay. With that in mind, I'm using Folk Art Paints. These were a couple of dollars per tub. I have a dark brown that I'm using for the base. I also picked up a green, hunter green, that I'm going to be using for some slight vine detail on the model, and also a raw sienna that I'm going to be using for dry brushing. Dry brushing is a technique used to highlight details of a model, usually with a lighter colour. It involves, unsurprisingly, using a dry brush and a very, very small amount of paint. Once almost all the paint is off the brush, you can move the brush very lightly across the surface of your model and the paint residue will only stay to the highest points. It's a real quick and dirty way of getting some highlighting onto a model and it works really well for grainy rough textures like the wood here that makes up Groot's skin. While that dried, it was time for a road trip. So I actually ordered this weeks ago. Kind of wondered where it got to, just assumed that with uh, with the pandemic it was pushed back. Checked on Amazon and it said that it had been delivered a week ago. Uh, and then I remembered that we just moved and I haven't updated my address. So, uh, public service announcements. If you move house, check Amazon's got your new address. job Amazon. Inside the parcel was an upgrade for the Jontitron 5000, a small UV powered rotary device. These things are sold for displaying jewellery items in store windows I suppose, but basically it's a small plinth that slowly turns around when powered by UV light. And these work great inside UV curing stations to make sure the model rotates and has a really good coverage of all sides. Saves me having to keep going back every minute and turning it round. I'm still having to go back every 90 seconds to click the light, but this is a big improvement. Also in the parcel was some Vallejo model wash. This is basically the opposite of dry brushing. This is a really wet paint that's going to gather in the crevices of a model and make those areas darker. The hobby desk light was all working, so it was time to head downstairs and apply the final coats. The wash goes on pretty liberally. You can always dab areas off if it goes on a little bit too thick in places you don't want it, but after a while you'll see it dry in the deepest areas of the model and give a real nice sense of depth. The last thing left to do was to paint his eyes. I've just gone for straight black here. In the films he does have like brown irises but that's way beyond my scope of ability at the moment and I feel like the black eyes looked good enough. He then got a coat of matte varnish and the finishing touch was to use epoxy resin on the eyes to give him that glazed realistic look. I took some q-tips and cut them in half with a hobby knife. You can obviously use a paintbrush here but it's going to be the last time you use that paintbrush. And then using some five minute epoxy gave a very light coat to the eyes. The good thing about epoxy resin is that it will level out as it dries so usually you end up with a really nice smooth finish. The negatives of epoxy resin are even if it's five minute resin it still takes quite a while till it's completely hardened so you have to be really careful with where you place the model so that it's out of the reach of any fingers, paws, dusty bits. And whilst you're waiting for it to dry, you can use the Q-tips and the leftover resin to make some nice modern art. And finally, it was done. I was really happy with how it turned out. Oh, and the Groot looks pretty good too. The first model I would quite happily put on my shelf. I really was pleased with the results. The thing is, everyone and his dog in the 3D printing world has a baby Groot. I'd started playing around with 3D modeling software, but I was still nowhere near ready for creating my own designs. If only there was somewhere you could go to build custom-ish models without the technical know-how. Till next week, thanks for watching. Be good.